I'm Lily O'Reilly. This is Lily O'Reilly Reviews, and today we're here to talk about Anal Sex 101. So let's get to it, huh? Okay, so this video was a commission on my Ko-Fi. I myself am not a great anal aficionado when it comes to receiving. However, I know my way around a strap. I've topped a lot of people. I am intimately familiar with the inner workings of the booty hole. So with the knowledge that I'm coming at it from primarily a topping perspective, although I've done my share of bottoming, let's get into it. The first thing that you have to decide when you're contemplating an anal sex journey is whether this journey is going to be solo or partnered. There are benefits and drawbacks to each of them. I personally am of the belief that one's first few expeditions into butt stuff should be done solo. Because frequently when you're with a partner, there's an expectation for you to respond a certain way, take a certain amount, be to perhaps dampen your own responses in terms of like, hey, this isn't fun, you're not hitting the right angle, I need more lube, that kind of thing. So I personally think that you should have to touch your own butt first to figure out how you feel about it in general before you commit to doing it with someone else. I am also of the slightly controversial belief that if you are expecting to put any part of your body into somebody else's ass, you need to have penetrated your own first. Because no matter how thoroughly you think you understand the concept of anal penetration, if you've not been on the receiving end of it, you don't really intimately know what it's like. So, if you're doing it solo, Everything I'm talking about mostly will still apply. Mine is like rimming, because if you can do that, you're part of a contortionist group and you are probably in the 201 course. Now, if you're doing it partnered, I would advise maybe watching the solo first and then bringing it to your partner and you guys can have a conversation about some of the things I bring up. It's incredibly important that you and your partner be on the same page with your expectations when it comes to anal sex. Is it, for instance, about you as the receiver orgasming? Is it about your partner as the penetrator getting a certain pleasure or orgasming from it? Is it because one or both of you is interested in size play or depth play or other advanced topics that we're not necessarily going to cover in depth here? You need to understand this because if you are in it, like when I bottom for butt stuff, I am in it all the way up until I orgasm and then I am done. I am no longer interested in anything to do with my butt. There have been miscommunications between myself and past partners because that's where my interest ends, but they believed that that interaction should be about their orgasm, specifically from anal penetration, and feelings got hurt, or I as the receiver felt like I had to tough it out, which wasn't an enjoyable experience. So have that conversation with your partner. If you guys are not mature enough to have that conversation, you are not mature enough to be doing butt stuff with each other possibly with anyone else. But like, if you can't talk about it, don't do it, okay? Ground rule. Other things you need to be aware of. If you are using toys on yourself or if you are topping your partner with a strap or toy. If you are monogamous with your toy and your butt, that toy is a butt toy for your butt. Okay. You can theoretically not use protection on that toy, not use a condom on that toy. And you're not gonna be any worse for the wear because it's your butt germs going into your own butt. Cool, I'm gonna say the word butt until it loses all meaning. <laughs> but, oh God. <laughs> However, if you are sharing that toy Either you're going to use it anally and vaginally, or it's going to go in your butt and other butts or anything. It is imperative that you use some kind of protection. 
especially if you're using a silicone toy. This is less of an issue with glass or metal, but those are, I consider more advanced for this application. If you're using silicone toys, frequently they will pick up butt smell. You will have poo smelling toys. And I, I still haven't found a good solution to getting butt smell out of toys. You, boiling them aggressively if they're silicone will sometimes help, but even that's not foolproof. The only method I've really found to get the smell out of the toy is to never get it into the toy in the first place. Use a good condom, latex or polyisoprene. Do not use lambskin because lambskin condoms have holes in them. Theoretically, the holes are small enough that the sperm can't get through, but things like STIs can. And I have a distinct feeling that the poo smell molecules are closer to the size of an STI molecule than they are of a sperm because when I've used lambskin condoms on my toys, they still get the butt funk. That's why if somebody's allergic to latex, I lean toward like the polyisoprene ones. Cool. Now, other things that you need to be very, very aware of are if you are playing with yourself or with a partner, anal sex does carry the risk of all the same sexually transmitted infections that any penetrative sex has, vaginal especially, but to a lesser degree oral. You need to, you and your partner need to be tested before engaging in penetrative sex that is unprotected. That's the word I needed. You should be protect, be bleh. You should be tested even when engaging in protected sex because barriers can break. That's where I'm at. So what can we get from sex? What can we get? <clears throat> so with any sex, of course, there are risks of HIV. There is HPV, which is human papillomavirus, which are warts. There are some vaccines for this, but not everyone has them. And those warts can lead to cancer. There are risks of especially with butt stuff, and I think specifically rimming, which is oral anal contact, you run the risk of various hepatitises. I think it's A, B, and E. I'm not entirely sure, but there are hepatitises that can scootle around. There is, of course, herpes. There's gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis. That, If you can get it from unprotected vaginal, you can get it from unprotected anal, more or less by and large. So please do use condoms, get tested. Okay. Now specifically with anal contact and specifically with oral anal rimming, but this can also apply if like somebody fingers your ass and then touches their dick and you do oral on their penis, you can get these. These are the ones that I call the food poisoning quadrant because they come from the contamination of fecal material into your oral cavity. This is why wash your hands before sex, wash your butt before sex. And we're gonna get into preparation next, but you can get Giardia, you can get E. coli, and you can get Salmonella from going ass to mouth, touching, the butt quadrant with fingers that go in the mouth or go in something that's going in the mouth from direct oral anal contact like rimming. <clears throat> you also, but if you're like, but I, I really want to rim them and you can't just like roll a condom over the tongue. <sighs> Take a lesson from the lesbians, my child, and create a barrier called a dam or a dental dam. Now there are some options. There are companies that make like thin latex panties that you can put on that you can lick through. And the secret to making barriers sexier is to put lube between the hole and the barrier. And then sometimes a little bit between the barrier and the mouth, like a flavored lube, can help cover up the I'm licking the sandwich wrapper feeling. It's worth it for me, especially if I'm having oral anal contact with a partner and I want to be absolutely certain that I'm not getting a booty funk in my mouth because there's nothing worse than finishing rimming and having to go take a shot of Listerine before you kiss them, go down on them, whatever. 
cool. So you have the latex panties, but if you are, you know, spur of the moment, or you are a size that the latex panties don't come in, you can buy what are called dental dams. They are rectangular sheets of, I believe they're latex. They're thin, they're stretchy. You can buy garters that you can clamp the sides to, to hold them in place. Or if you're like me, you just kind of stick it in place and it doubles as holding their thighs apart and then lick. Problem solved. Oh, and if you don't have those and you are on, like, you need it, you need it now. Take a condom of whatever type that you are comfortable with, clip the tip off, slice it up the side, and you have, you know, a dental dam, roughly. Okay, so we've gone over a lot of the bad stuff. You can get sick from it. You can contract mini STIs from it, the, all of this. You also need to be aware for the mental preparation of having anal sex. It can feel more vulnerable than vaginal sex if you're a vagina owner. Mm -hmm. It can bring up a lot of repressed trauma sometimes. It can feel overwhelming, especially if you are a man that is bottoming. I know that there's a lot of very uncomfortable connotations between bottoming for anal sex, even in a hetero couple, and the supposed gayness of the bottom. It's not, it really isn't, but you know, there are those implications. So be sure that you've kind of like, even if you haven't worked through it, be aware and be communicative with your partner that emotions may come up and you need to be ready to handle them in the moment. And you also need to be sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Do not force yourself into doing butt stuff just because your partner wants you to do it. I had this talk a lot when I worked in the sex shop because I would talk to guys that came in to buy lube because, well, she's going to do it. And I'm like, does she want to do it? No, but she's going to do it. And I'm like, that is, that is an interesting approach to take to somebody that you care about, but okay. So make sure you're doing it for the right reasons in as much as you do any sex for the right reasons. And now for the physical. The absolute bare minimum level that you need to do when bottoming is wash your ass. Wash between the cheeks. Rub the soap on your outer sphincter and rinse it off. Open the cheeks and wash in between. This, this is, the bar is in hell, okay? But I have had many a sweet guy show up and be like, okay, so I'm gonna bottom for you, right? And it's just like, <sniffs> don't do that. Don't do that to your partner. They will never view you as sexual in the same way again if your butt makes a crunching noise when you open it. Now there are two schools of thought when it comes to cleaning out that for me differ depending on is this going to be on camera or recreational. So if you are going to be on camera or some way that you need to be squeaky clean, absolutely no chance of any poo whatsoever, although it's a but. You and your partner both need to be aware of the fact that you are misappropriating an orifice. Your butt is made to poop. <clears throat> it just is. Butts are for pooping. The fact that you are also able to derive sexual pleasure from it is great, but you don't go to a cow farm and then complain that there are cows there, okay? Be ready with yourself that there is a non-zero chance that there might be poo. It doesn't have to be like poo, but there might be poo. Cool? Cool. Now, if you need to be the squeakest of clean, we need to go the enema route. Enemas come in many types. The basic premise is you are putting water into your colon and you have a lower colon and an upper colon. For most recreational sex, including like fisting and other advanced topics that we're not tackling here, 
lower colon enemas are sufficient. You are putting enough water into the low colon to extend it slightly and then rinse out any poo chunks that are sticking to the sides the same way that you use your tap to rinse out a cup of like that's been sitting in your sink and then you pour it out and all the stuff stuck to the sides comes out. Perfect. If you overfill when using an enema and you get water into the upper colon, it is going to be a much longer process to get all of that water back out of you. So be prepared. And this is a trial and error thing. But there is a marked difference between the experience of doing a lower colon enema, which is quick, you know, under an hour, cleanable, and an upper colon enema, which takes like over an hour and you're going to be on the toilet for a while trying to get all the water out because if you don't get all the water out, it will show up when you're fucking. And that's not when you want to find a whole bunch of retained poo water. Just, just trust me. It's, it's not. <laughs> now, a lot of enema formulations that you run into have stuff added to them, stuff to make your insides cramp, to make you poo aggressively, to be more laxative effect. And by and large, you don't need any of that. Honestly, some of the best enemas that I've recommended to others and that I've used myself are just essentially a warm saline solution. Because all you're doing is getting water up in there, giving it a little rustle around, and having it move the poo out that was just in the loading dock already. I do not do this. I do not enema. Because I don't do butt stuff on camera, really. Hardly ever. And when I do, it's off the cuff. I do not do it in a studio setting. It is not a need that I have. I am not going to all night butt stuff parties. I'm not doing any of that. So when I need my butt to be clean, I go the natural route. You can buy fiber pills. They're in like the Metamucil quadrant or the digestive health part of your store. They're called psyllium husk fiber pills. I buy the generics, okay? And you could buy Metamucil, which is the powder that you put in the cup and stir, but that stuff clumps up and it is the most disgusting texture. So I get the pill, little, little cap. You take your caplet, you drink eight to 14 ounces of water with it. It expands in your stomach into a thick fibrous gel. And this is perfectly healthy to take regularly. And it just helps provide enough bulk to move everything out. It is... If an enema is like putting water in a cup and shaking it and pouring the water out, this is like putting a wash rag in your cup and like rubbing it gently. The stuff's still going to come out. It's just the mechanism. Also, enemas are on demand. The natural fiber method takes, you know, however long it takes for stuff to move through your insides. It varies person to person. If you get a sufficient amount of natural fiber in your diet, you eat roughage, you eat veggies, you have, you know, a healthy human diet, you probably don't even need the fiber pills. But, like, they never hurt to take, you know? I'm not a doctor. They mostly never hurt to take. And over time, you learn to have a feeling with your body. Like, if you're... There's going to be explicit poo talk for a second. <sighs> If your poos are coming out, you know, reasonably firm, they're clean, there's not a lot of like wiping that you have to do to get everything tidy afterward, you can probably just take a poo and make sure you're tidied up. And that's good enough for most at-home anal play. If you are having runny poos or messy poos or tummy trouble or non-solid poos, that's a sign that you need to be upping the fiber in your diet to get yourself in a bowel-ready state to clean out naturally. I'm sorry, the cats are having anal opinions. I, I don't, I'm not responsible for them. The one thing that I do have to warn you about when it comes to enemas is you don't, don't do them too much. There's no real risk in just maintaining a fairly high fiber diet. It's good for your cholesterol, other reasons, whatever. Makes your butt clean. But if you are doing 
enemas on a fairly regular basis, they can degrade the mucosal lining inside your colon. So a vagina, by and large, self-lubricates. It handles its own squish when it comes to penetration. Butts don't. Butts have a layer of mucus inside your intestines that help the poo move along. It's what keeps everything slimy, but it's not prepared for the motion of anal sex. That's part of why, as we're gonna to touch on in a minute, lube is so important. However, just like you can wash things out of a cup with running water, you can wash the mucosal lining, not entirely, but you can degrade it with repeated enemas. And that means that if your mucosal lining is degraded, you are more likely to suffer things like micro tears or more standard tears or just abrasion and discomfort and all of these things, which also open you up to being more likely to, you know, catch an STI if you're not using adequate protection or if your barrier breaks. So on that note, lube. Lube is the most important Lube is one of the most important aspects of anal sex, anal play, whatever. Two rules that I expect you to follow no matter what. Spit is not lube. Spit in and of itself, no matter how thick or how copious, is not an anal lubricant. I also think it's a gross vaginal lubricant, but that's between you and your pussy. Not okay for anal. And two, no numbing lube in your butt. None. Never. Bad plan. I don't care how nervous you are. I don't care how new you are. It is never a good idea to shut down your biofeedback when it comes to an area that can so readily become damaged or torn in which the person penetrating you cannot feel if you are receiving damage. Okay? Okay. Because the person who is penetrating you, whether it's an aftermarket penis or a bio penis, they can't feel if you've sustained a tear. They can't feel if you're bleeding. They can't feel if you're becoming abraded, especially if you're using a barrier method like a condom. So please, if there's one thing that you get out of this video, do not use numbing lube on your ass because you will not be able to tell if you're going too fast or too deep or if you're out of lube or whatever. It will wind up hurting you. Maybe not the first time and maybe not every time. You get a real proper anal fissure because you used numbing lube and didn't feel that you were past the point of bad. You will have a very embarrassing visit with your doctor and you will definitely reconsider your stance on numbing lube. Cool? Cool. Now, <clears throat> what type of lube should we use? I am a fan of oil-based lubes for anal. However, oil can degrade latex. Iffy on if oil is unacceptable for polyisoprene or other non-latex condoms, I've used them together without issue, but anecdotal is not the same as research-based. So... <sighs> Basically, you want the thickest lube you can get when it comes to anal because you want it to create a thick layer and that will help avoid damage. So I kind of swear by the OG Crisco. I appreciate boy butter. Both of those are very good oil-based options. Boy butter's fun because it comes in the little like crock and it's cute. I believe it is an oil silicone hybrid though, so you need to keep that in mind if you're using silicone toys. I also like some of the thicker silicone water hybrids because they're compatible with every kind of condom pretty much but not the toys. So if you're using uncondomed toys, try to avoid silicone hybrid lubes. I enjoy and appreciate water-based lube nine times out of 10. They're not my favorite for anal because water-based lubes that are thick enough to provide you the correct kind of lubrication for anal often dry out and become tacky very quickly. And unlike on a vagina that is creating its own lubrication that helps keep a water-based lube slippery, your butt is not providing lubrication and it's very hard to get spit that far up in a butt 
if it gets tacky, like at the end of the penetrative zone. So all else same, oil, oil hybrids, water hybrids, silicone, water. Water is not my favorite. But what's very important is use a lube. Always use a lube, no matter what fanfic you have read. Like axle grease is not a lube. Conditioner is not a lube. Soap is not a lube. Um, God, what else have I seen used? Spits not, blood's not, snot's not. Like just oil, oil silicone, silicone and water, silicone, water, like a lube. Please, a lube that comes in a bottle. Yes, I know. <laughs> Just lube. Oh, I know. Now, okay, you've listened to me rant about all of this. Let's talk about actual functional nuts and bolts of anal. The first step for anal is stretching. Because your butt is used to penetration happening from the inside out. It's a one-way shoot of poo. It is not really physiologically prepared for things to go the other way. So you have to communicate to your body that this invasion, that this invasion is acceptable and non-harmful. And one of the best ways that you can do that is by stretching. Now, anuses that are trained, and I mean like serious depth players or girth players, can take toys. There are videos, not of me, but there are videos. And it's really impressive. You, if we're on the 101, you're not there. Don't try to be there. Start with a finger, preferably your own finger, preferably whichever finger you can get there with based on your mobility. If you do not have the mobility for your own fingers, um, someone else's finger is fine if they will listen to you unquestionably about how much depth you want and what kind of movement you want and when to stop. Or toys, not even this big. I would not even recommend this for a very, very first timer. I would go with a much smaller toy. And also very small butt plugs are fine. Now remember, things are only safe in your butt if they are physically attached to a person like this, or if they have a, a flare at the bottom that looks roughly like that so that they can't get in there. Because once something makes it into your butt, your anus will close underneath it and you now have a suction that you have to fight against to get the toy out. I'm sure there will be people in my comments saying, oh, it's fine, you just push like you're taking a poo and it'll come out, but no, no, we're not playing that game because if you're wrong, you have to go to the doctor and that's awkward and you'll wind up on one of those TV shows about how sex sent you to the ER and we don't want that. Make sure that your toys have the little hang loose at the bottom so they can't make it into your butt or make it be somebody's fingers. Now, with lube, more lube than you think you'll need. Insert a finger. This is just getting yourself used to the feeling. You can do this either while you're doing some kind of other masturbation, genital touching. You do normally want to be some kind of turned on, but you don't, know, you don't have to be. I'm not judging. With lube, take a finger, slide it in. Notice how you have an external sphincter and then as you get in, you may, may not feel a secondary sphincter because the longer the thing you're putting in there, the more doors you have to successfully knock on to gain entry. So you want to, normally with one finger, you can slide it in without any problem. And if you're a guy, no. And if you have a prostate, now's a good time to look for it. It's generally, toward the front part of the pelvic cavity, about a f two knuckles in, you just kind of tap up toward your belly button and you'll feel something that feels kind of like a chestnut. It's about half dollar size, kind of vaguely domed. 
if you're on the receiving end, you should theoretically be able to recognize it. As somebody who's only been on the giving end of prostates, all I can say is I know what it feels like when I hit it. You may or may not be prostate reactive if you have one. You're just gonna have to experiment because some people like tapping, some people like rocking, some people only respond well to vibrating butt plugs. Like, this is your body and just like with any form of masturbation, it's trial and error. You can also, to a degree, hit the G-spot from the anus, but it's harder because you got a whole open quadrant of vaginal cavity that you have to tap through. So by and large, I do not say that people with G-spots should be trying aggressively to hit the G-spot from the butt. I don't know. It's just, trust me when I say that anal, when you also have a vagina, is just a different kind of feeling. <clears throat> Now, the workup is you'll use fingers, you can use tongue if you are helping somebody else stretch out. Tongue is a great, so like if fingers are step one, tongue can be the prologue. Tongue is the convincing everything to soften up and loosen up and not be so worried and adding a little bit of gentle lubricant that does not take the place of real lubricant and just it is sexy the same way that any oral is sexy, you know? But it's not a necessity. And if you're bottoming to anal and you don't like rimming, you are valid and I see you. So, there's rimming, there's fingers. The next step up from fingers would be a small toy or butt plug. Make sure it has a flare. What small means is up to you. Like if you've played around with one finger, two fingers, maybe three, but I've always found three fingers in the butt to make my hand cramp up. It's an awkward arrangement for your hand to be in. So generally two fingers gives you a little bit of width. You can kind of scissor them or wiggle them gently to help loosen the muscles. But the important thing is do not rush. Let whoever is receiving the butt stuff communicate to you that they want more, deeper, faster, or conversely, hey, slow down, uh, that, that's a little bit of a burn, can we take that finger out? Um, you're, oof, you're going too deep, let's kinda back up on this a bit. Because if the butt doesn't feel safe, the butt is not going to cooperate. But, you do, uh, but again, however, you do need to consider both the depth and the width because people like different things. I, for instance, when I am bottoming for anal, which is rare, I like depth, don't really love width, never been one for width, but mm -hmm. as I've reviewed and as I've demoed, like I have no issue with things like snakes or tentacles or long penetrables because listening to your body and learning to navigate those sphincters is fine. Convincing the outside sphincter to open, not my forte. The person who is bottoming to anal, however, might be different. So it is important for you to listen to what you want out of your body if you're bottoming and try out different toys to find what, you know, tickles your fancy. It's just like any other kind of masturbation just with better lube, hopefully. Now, if you are actually partnered or solo, this applies equally, positions are important, mostly because bottoming to anal is a little more strenuous, in my opinion, as a bottom occasionally, than bottoming for vaginal penetration. It just, I don't know just is. So you need to A, be aware that whether you are topping someone with a prostate or someone with a G-spot, it's in the same area. So a lot of times the positions that translate well to G-spotting will translate well to hitting the prostate, just mostly. What you have to balance though is the comfort of the bottom and the top versus ease of access. So I am pillow princessy when I bottom. 
The only position that I like to bottom in is flat on my stomach with a pillow under my ass to kind of knock it up into the correct position. That's it. I do not put any effort into it. In that situation, I am prioritizing my comfort as a bottom over the comfort of the top and over ease of access. But if I, when I'm topping, have to work around a physical limitation, like, I don't know, let's say I just had leg day, my legs are not cooperating. In that case, you have to consider positions like, okay, maybe I need to sit and they need to ride me. This can be incredibly helpful if you have someone bottoming that is new or nervous or you have an overzealous top. Letting the person on top completely control the level, the angle, the depth, all of it, of the penetration can really help make bottoming feel safer. The downside is you have to engage your thighs and your core more. And if you're already tense, that can make everything more tense. And that can cause a little more discomfort and make it a little harder to get the sphincter to relax for penetration. But you get gravity. Gravity helps. It See what I mean? Generally speaking, I recommend a couple positions. Having the bottom on top where they can control the riding is a very good one. Having the bottom on all fours, like for doggy, can be good. However, and this is going to be a real blanket thing, but straight men who bottom for strap-on or for anal do not, generally speaking, understand how to angle their hips. Because if you're on all fours and you have your hips tucked under you, your butt is pointed at the mattress and it's very hard to get the toy in it. But as, you know, people who bottom for penises or straps, if you roll your hips up a little, it's easier to get access for penetration. I don't know why they don't seem to grasp this concept. But if doggy is already a position in which you're familiar with receiving penetration, it's not a bad one to receive anal in, especially if you stack the hip pillows so you can not be as tense. Um, prone bone is also a very good one where you just kind of pancake on your stomach, pillows under your ass to give it a little bit of heft. It can, if you are a larger booty individual, make it kind of hard for your top to achieve penetration, especially if they or the toy is on the short end and you have booty. Yeah. But I mean, that's no different than a vaginal sex position. So a lot of the same, a lot of the same tips, tricks, and caveats that apply to vaginal sex positions can be translated pretty whole cloth over to anal sex. I trust you to do your own research and find your own comfort level there. And I know I'm going to have people in the comments like, oh, well, you can do anal and missionary and maybe you can. I don't bring it up for me personally, because if I'm topping, that is a lot of thigh to be supporting and holding up while I'm also focusing on the topping and the strap game. And if I'm on the bottom, that is a lot of stress on my low back. So it's not one that I personally endorse, but if it's good for you, it's good for you. And I completely respect it. And as always, this is sex. Communicate with your partner. Be able to say, oh, my, my, you know, I've got a Charlie horse in my thigh. We got to move or, eh, my low back's starting to hurt, or hey, I know that this is kind of doing it for you, but I can't, like, I'm getting winded, topping, we need a different whatever. Communicate. And do not be afraid to be like, hey, yo, I need more lube. It is always better to apply more lube than it is to have to tap out completely because you rubbed the inside of your butt raw and then it hurts to poo for three days. It just is communicate with the person that you're trusting with your orifices. Now, as I was saying, always add lube. Use more lube than you think you need. Be careful if the person you're fucking has a vagina and you're in doggy because you need to make sure that the lube does not get squelched out of the butt and make it into the vagina because that can equal a really, really gnarly vaginal infection. And we don't want to do that to people. So 
keep an eye on that if you're topping and make sure that you're not cross-contaminating things. And no ass to anywhere. I don't care if you saw it in porn. People in porn are getting paid hazard pay. They've usually starved themselves the day of. They have done extensive cleaning and they still sometimes get food poisoning from it, okay? And that is with like the squeaky clean butt. You don't take, you don't go ass to anywhere but the shower. There's no ass to oral. There is no ass to vaginal. There will never be ass to vaginal. Do not. But when you are done in the butt, you wash your hands, you take off your condom and throw it away. If you have done unprotected penile anal interface, you go pee because you need to get the poo particles out of your urethra before you develop a UTI or a bladder infection. Cool? And you wash it. If you have to, wash it in the sink, but preferentially wash it in the shower. Always clean everything. And I forgot, do not brush your teeth before engaging in rimming if you're doing it unprotected because when you brush your teeth, you create micro tears in your gums and it makes it easier for all of the butt stuff to get into your gums. Actually, don't brush your teeth before you engage in any kind of oral interfacing with people. It's gross and uh, it opens you up to infection. Okay, so that is how to do anal. Now, after you're done, I understand that a lot of people don't necessarily fully think about what needs to happen after sex. They're like, we achieved the sex, yay! But after sex is when you need to be sitting, check in with your body as a top or as a bottom, check in with your partner, take a minute and be like, once the endorphins and the dopamine have died down a little, how am I feeling in my body physically? Am I sore? Am I uncomfortable? Am I, you know, any kind of issues there? Check in with your partner like, hey, how was that for you physically, emotionally? Did you, you know, is that something we want to do again? No pressure. Uh, maybe it's, hey, I know that that was fun for you, but I didn't really like that. And I don't know if I want to do that again. And that's valid. You're allowed to try things and realize they're not for you. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, there is always a chance with anal sex that there will be blood. There just is. The anal mucosa is thin. It can get abraded. It can tear easily. My personal guide for how to know if I have, eh, there's blood versus I fucked up blood. If the blood is... Well, ideally, there's never blood, but you know, shit happens. So if the blood is light in color and there's not much of it and it doesn't continue for more than like a day, that is the, okay, I was a little too rough. I need to dial it back. I need to use more lube. I need to use a smaller toy. I need to, you know, whatever it is. I need to do less next time because I may have, torn things a little, but that is usually no more extreme than like you have had a constipation poo and something got uncomfortable on the way out. If, however, the blood is dark in color, and I mean like, you know the difference between, you know, a light scrape blood and a blood. If the blood is dark in color, if there is a lot of it, or if you can't get it to stop. And there is a difference between I've had like intermittent dark blood that's lasted a day. Yeah, that, that's worrisome. But if like you are bleeding, go to the doctor. Seriously, your pride is not worth you having serious issues because you didn't want to tell them you put stuff in your butt. They're doctors. If they're a bad doctor and they can't respect that, then get a new one. But light, sparse, gone in a day or at most two, you're fine. Deep red, lots of it happens every time you do any kind of booty push, even if it's just a little flex, go to the doctor. 
Now this is a spectrum. This is not a toggle. This is the I don't really worry and this is the I would be going to the ER settings for me. I have, however, had lots of light pink spotty blood and been like, okay, I definitely fucked up. Didn't go to the doctor. Was fine. Maybe should have gone. I don't know. I've also had maybe some splotchy darker blood, but it quit within an hour or two. That was for me kind of a, okay, we're going to watch this. If it reappears later, we go to the doctor, but otherwise, eh. And that was fine, but I am not a doctor. This comes down to what are you comfortable with? What are you trusting your body with? And if you can afford to, always err on the side of going to the doctor. That's what they're there for. So I'm sorry that I did end this with, by the way, you can really fuck up your butt. But you can. Like vaginas are made for a certain level of penetration. Butts aren't. You are treading in ground that is not meant to be trodden. And you have to make peace with the fact that there are risks. There's poo. There's a theoretically bleeding. There could be tears. There could be damage. It can theoretically cause hemorrhoids. Like... There are issues that could happen, and I want you to be aware of all of them before you agree to do this. <sighs> that was a lot, but that's what I've got. So, hopefully that helped give you a fairly well-rounded concept of what butt stuff might mean to you. And uh, for me, it is by and large a nope. Um, <laughs> however, if you would like to see the things I do online, which pretty much never include butt stuff, but do occasionally. That is all find.liliareilly.com. If you would like to throw me a couple bucks on Ko-Fi or commission videos, not exactly like this one, but you know, maybe it made you think of something. That is all at ko-fi.com slash liliareilly. And I do believe I heard the rustling of dinner happening, so I'm going to wrap this up. I'm gonna go get dinner. You're marvelous. Be good to your butt, be good to each other. I'll talk to you later. Mm -hmm.